Happy Sabbath and welcome to Decolonizing Adventist Theology, the panel hosted by yours truly, Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. I am so excited to share this platform with all of you. It is my prayer that people are enlightened, inspired, and that the hearts and spirits of all are set free through the result of this broadcast. I would now like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Chaplain Danielle Pilgrim. Chaplain Pilgrim is a current a PhD student at Point Park University and the Associate Chaplain at Andrews University. Previously, she served as the Associate Pastor for Youth and Young Adults, Discipleship and Community Engagement at the Berean Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Next, we have Pastor Ingram London. Pastor London holds a MDiv degree from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Barron Springs, Michigan, where he is also currently pursuing a doctorate in systematic theology. His particular research interests include black theodicy and sanctuary typology. He is married to Dr. Jeremy London, and they have one daughter, Abigail Mary London. Next, we have Pastor Terrence Taylor. Terrence Taylor is the pastor of the New Movement Church located in Pasco, Washington. He works with several local community organizations and coalitions and serves on several boards for the North Pacific Union Conference. He is a graduate of Walla Walla University. He is currently enrolled in a, doctor, in a doctoral program at Seattle University doing work around the intersections of liberation theology, queer studies, diversity and inclusion, and corporate social responsibility as a framework for reimagining Adventist theology and practice in the public space. Last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Olive Hemmings, who is a professor of religion at Washington Adventist University. She teaches biblical theology, Pauline theology, introduction to the New Testament, and other New Testament courses, such as New Testament Greek and moral issues in world religions. I want, I want each of you, I want to thank each of you for agreeing to share your thoughts today. Additionally, I would also like to, to thank, as I always do, uh, Mr. Kirk Nugent and Composition for facilitating our audiovisual needs for the program, and my wife for her support in the background. Before we move for or further, I will ask that our viewers share this presentation with your friends, family, and loved ones on your Facebook page or forward them the YouTube link or feel free to share directly from my website. My website is Dr. Sydney Freeman Jr. dot com. That is Dr. Sydney Freeman Jr. dot com. But before I begin with questions, I would like to ask Chaplain Pilgrim to pray and invite God's presence into this discussion. Let's pray. God and our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the blessing of this day. And now, God, as we talk together on the topic, we pray, oh God, that you would give us the wisdom that we need, that your presence would be with us. Lord, we pray most of all that you would liberate us from our, our preconceived notions and our biases so that we can uh, be free and become who you've called us to be. We ask for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Pilgrim. And just some housekeeping before uh, we will begin. Uh, I will have several questions that will get us started. In between questions, we will be looking out for questions in the comment section. And uh, both, it could be either on YouTube, on the YouTube, through the YouTube chat, or the Facebook comment section. After we get about halfway through, we will go to a quick commercial, uh, and then we will take additional questions from the audience. F please feel free to enter your questions in uh, the YouTube chat or the Facebook comment section. 
uh, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So to get started, Dr. Hemmings, I would like to start with you. What does the term theology mean? Okay, see, seems like a, a simple, short question, but I, let, 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 me, let me not take anything for granted. Uh, let's look at the term theology. Theology has its roots in the Greek language. It combines two words, theos, meaning God, and logos, meaning word or reason or speech, etc. It literally, literally means ideas about God or thoughts about God, reasoning about God. So these ideas about God, what we call theology, does not develop in a vacuum. And, and though theology emerges from many sources, the fundamental source of theology is the daily living and interaction of people in the world. Theology emerges from the world as we experience it and perceive it. So even though as Christians, we may all go to the Bible as the source of our theology, people come away from it with different theologies because yeah. we are experiencing the world differently. Now, there was a time when we thought that theology is a system of ideas about God and God's will passed down to us in small or large books from Europe, especially from German. When I did my PhD, I, I had to pass a very difficult exam, a German exam and French as well, before I could advance to candidates. So that's how Europeanized or theology has been. And, and then somewhere it hit us in the theology academy that the common people are doing their own theology. Mm. And they're often doing it subversively based on how they live in the world. So take the underground railroad, rail, 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 <laughs> the underground railroad. That was based on a subversive theology that defied the theology of slavery. And when Sojourner Truth, for example, delivered her speech of, at the 1851 Women's Convention in Ohio, she delivered that speech out of the depths of her own struggles of being worked to the point of death, of being raped, of being beaten, of having her children sold off to other plantations never to see them again. And so she was able to make the most widely quoted theological statement at that convention when she said, and I'm going to read it. And she pointed at a little man in black in the crowd. When that man in black says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman, where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman? Man had nothing to do with him. And then she goes on to say, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they are asking, they is asking to do it. So the men better let them. So what I'm saying here is that theology comes from the very heart and soul of a people. And so the latter half of the 20th century saw the rise of this fundamental aspect of theology as it moved into the mainstream of the academy, mainly in the form of liberation theologies, such as black theology, feminist theology, womanist theology, queer theology, and so on. These are theologies that reflect this real life experience of people in the world as they try to make sense of their experiences against the larger scheme of things. Wow, so based that, on that, we can look at theology today, decolonizing Adventist theology. <laughs> yeah, so so what I, I think I heard, what I got from what you were saying is that theology is actually practical. It actually yeah. is born out of uh, people's lived lived experience. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that um, has surfaced for our particular people group, there's been different uh, liberation theologies, but there's been uh, black liberation theology, there's been Caribbean theology, uh, there's also womanist theology, which was actually a critique of black theology as it was not necessarily, as uh, all, it wasn't as encompassing 
of gender as it could be. Uh, so since I, I mentioned black uh, black liberation theology, uh, I'll, I'll, may, I'll throw this to uh, Pastor Taylor. Um, what is uh, black liberation theology and how can we connect it to the to the Adventist context? Great. Well, I just want to say again, thank you so much for the invitation to be on the panel. And it's really a blessing to hear all these great scholars and thinkers. And I'm just excited to uh, hear what's going to be shared today. I think of it like a Thanksgiving meal and somebody's got the turkey and the dressing and the macaroni and cheese. I'm just going to drop the forks and the sparkling cider off and finish out the meal. But, to, um, to furky, doc. <laughs> to to furky. Furky. I don't, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think that's a great question um, because when we think about what Black, uh, and I think Dr. Humes really just laid it out very well, um, what theology really is, is God talk. It's how we talk about God from the different perspectives that we come from and the different lenses that we have as people. I know, I know before we've really been taught there's really one lens, as she mentioned, uh, one source of in the academy that kind of has the primary voice of what theology uh, is and what it does. Um, so if I could just back up to uh, Adventist theology, then um, mm -hmm. talk about black uh, theology, especially liberation theology. For me, um, I have a different uh, perspective of Adventist theology. I actually had this for a while. Uh, for me, I actually don't think there is such a thing as Adventist theology. What mm. I believe, what makes us, uh, what Adventist theology is, is actually an Adventist hermeneutic. It's the way we look at scripture. It's the way we look at the Bible. Now, as Adventists, we say that we believe what the Bible teaches. We believe in a biblical theology. So from an Adventist hermeneutic, we believe in what biblical theology says, which informs our theology. And so to own a sense of theology would mean to, in some ways, um, disregard the biblical theology or it would be a little bit uh, contradictory uh, in what we talk about. So I've always seen it as how we read scripture is what makes us Adventists. Really how people read uh, have been taught a hermeneutic. And when we're becoming Adventists, or we really are taught how to read the Bible a certain way. And there are people that we've met that have been reading the Bible like an Adventist, didn't know they were Adventists, reading the Bible hmm. like an Adventist, and then stumbled up upon us. So yeah. really as, um, as, as Adventist pastors, we're taught to really be biblical theologians. We're taught systematic theology, but primarily we're taught to be biblical theologians. We're not really taught to be theologians uh, in the sense of we're taught to learn how to explain what the conclusions are from our hermeneutic. So we're mm -hmm. given the tools, but we're really taught the conclusions of it. So um, to me, that's been the most universal way for me to understand um, Adventist theology, acknowledging that theology is personal, it is mm. practical, it is organic. And I think what uh, some people are afraid of is the room that that gives to what it means to be an Adventist. I would say most Adventists really just agree on about 80% of their personal theology and how they want to relate to God. And that's what mm -hmm. makes them us. But there's wow. also that margin, right? That's that everybody has their own personal thing. Just go to any Sabbath school class and you'll hear that. So black liberation theology is really just seeing it from a black lens. It's coming from where you are and talking to God um, from that perspective. I believe firmly in the sovereignty of God. I think the Bible um, gives us that that view that God is, we can't box God in. We can't box God into a gender. We really can't box God into one place. God can show up anywhere God wants to. And so uh, can God, what does God look like to me? We've I've been taught the God of Abraham, Abram and the God of Sarai, but what's the God of Hagar? right mm. uh, it's a different god shows up to us differently and so from our our perspective we look at god that way so black uh, liber uh, black theology is basically to say where has god shown up for us as black people through our lens having the full uh, agency to look at god through our lens and relate to god from there thank you so much for that i um 
I think it's important to uh, even in this discussion just say why why this discussion is in, is, is even important maybe to our audience who is a lay audience that is trying to make sense of where we're using this term theology why is this a, even important to the to everyday member in the church or someone that's interested uh in their spiritual journey uh pastor london could you could you maybe address that sure you yeah could you repeat that though repeat the question so so essentially why is this discussion important uh why would this discussion be important to everyday folks uh because we're sure. using the term theology and, and sometimes that can create barriers for people. Right. So I, I think Dr. Hemings uh, really hit the nail on the head. But in, in reality, we're, we all do theology, whether you know it or not. You, you have a theology, even if it's a denial the, of the existence of God. That's still a theology <laughs> It's in, in a sense. So we're all doing theology. So th why this is important is that we we want to be intentional about the theology that we're doing as well. We want to think about what are the presuppositions that we have about God. We want to challenge those presuppositions, especially if they're presuppositions that have been taught to us um, from entities or institutions that may not have our best interests at heart, uh, which is the reason why we're talking about black theology today, uh, to do theology from a, a black uh, perspective. So I, I think the important thing for people to understand is that there is no such thing as a pure, um, I don't even want to use that term, but a, a, uh, an unbiased theology. All theology, mm -hmm. uh, this side of, of, of the second coming is, is biased. We don't have uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> God's uh, direct revelation in regards to uh, different issues that we, that we may be encountering uh, in our existence today. Uh, but what we do have is that we have scripture, we have our own personal experiences uh, with God that Dr. Hemmings and, and, uh, and Pastor Taylor have, have touched on. And what we need to recognize is that every time that we approach the subject of God, uh, as we're doing theology, to study God or to study the scriptures, which we believe are the revelation of God, not the supreme revelation of God, Christ is the supreme revelation, but still the scriptures are a revelation of God as well. That when we are looking at these things, we are not looking at them unbiased. Uh, we do have a lens that we're looking at, at them through, and it's usually our life experiences. And one of the things that ties us together, uh, at least in, in, in the North American experience of people with a darker hue of skin, is our blackness. And so when we're looking at scripture, we are not just looking at it in an unbiased way. We are looking at it uh, from the lens of being black and from the black experience. And that is not a um, that is not a, a a a subset of theology. It is its own theology in its own right. When someone says that they are teaching uh, theology, um, just because they're not telling you it's white theology doesn't mean it isn't white. The it is still white theology. Yeah, right. So right. that black theology is a is a theology just as legitimate as as white theology, um, and 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 has a a voice and, and needs to be heard. So okay, black the I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I inject here? Is it Yes, a, please. Okay. Cuz cuz I want to go back cuz I uh, Terrence, I appreciate uh the fact that you say Adventists we really have a hermeneutic. And the truth is Terrence, that is what we want to think. We have a hermeneutic. But we do have a theology. <laughs> it's in our name, Seventh-day Adventists. Hmm. And the theology is, is essentially an evacuation theology. We we oh. bring, we win souls to the church so that we can prepare them to evacuate. And that can, that's a, it's okay, nothing wrong with the theology, but it, it becomes problematic when in our preparation for evacuation, we do not attend, we do not see that we have to be involved in those systems of oppression uh, and, 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 uh, and apply ourselves to, to uh, subverting the systems of oppression today that that's which is the reason why we even gathered here to talk about black adventist <laughs> theology so i think if i may call that theology it seventh day adventist it suggests evacuation mm -hmm. and and that that is problematic to the extent that we do not apply ourselves to the systemic problems in the world that is causing 
you know, so much suffering. Uh, so that's my <laughs> say on that. Chaplain Pilgrim looks like she's trying right. to jump in. <laughs> Woo! I mean, she just hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I mean, our anthropology is what informs the way that we structure ourselves as a church, right? So she, she, she mentioned um, the, you know, evacuation theology. It, it's exactly what we do. And so the reason why we upheld racism within our Adventist community is because the eschatology, the reason why uh, we uh, condoned slavery was the same, re the same reason. It's all about, well, you, you, you suffer now because Jesus is coming. And that's why we as a black, our, you know, our black uh, ancestors, you know, they sang so much songs about heaven because to them, the only escape from this was leaving the earth. And we preach this, the white theology preaches that, you know, Jesus was aloof to the, the powers that be within our society. And so our responsibility is just to get people prepared for the kingdom that's to come. Neglecting that there's a kingdom here that Jesus also addressed yes. as yes. well. So yes. I, I think, uh, I, I agree with both. Uh, I agree with uh, Pastor Terrence and Dr. Hemming that we do have a hermeneutic, but we also have this uh, evacuation theology that informs everything that we do. And I think it also brings to light that there's something called bad theology. Uh, mm. I, I feel that there's bad theology <laughs> when a certain group of people becomes oppressed, right? And, and that's something that we have to address, that, that there's bad theology. Could, could you unpack that? Right. You, 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 can't, you can't say a term like that and, and just, just drop it. Well, what, what do you mean by bad theology? I mean, bad theology uh, is when your view of God and your view of biblical concepts oppresses a certain uh, certain group or certain groups of people, right? And so the whole notion about slavery and I'll use the biblical uh, hermeneutics to, to say that, uh, you know, God condoned it was bad theology, right? Um, mm -hmm. The whole evacuation theology as well as, you know, the way out of this, the way out of slavery, the way out of racism, the way out of oppression is when God comes. That's also bad yeah. theology as well. Um, and when we say that, you know, we're not supposed to get involved in politics and we're not supposed to get involved in, you know, the, the things that are going on in our, our world, that's also bad theology as well. When we interpret scripture so that we stay silent and complicit to the, to the, the isms that we experience in our society. And that's what I would say with bad theology. It, it looked like Pastor London, London was, yeah. was trying to jump in there. I'm sorry. Come on in. No, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd just like to just to expand a little bit on, on what is Adventist theology, I, I do want mm -hmm. to put out there that there isn't just one Adventist theology. There are several mm. different types of, of Adventists. I, I owe, uh, well, one, one way of looking at it is something that I, I received from uh, Dr. Fernando Canali. I think he's retired now uh, at the seminary, but I think he has a, a interesting way of, 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 uh, kind of compartmentalizing different uh, approaches to Adventism. So he speaks of a, a fundamentalist, historicist Adventism that is basically trapped in the 1930s and in, in fundamentalism, they just cannot move forward uh, from that. They have a verbal inspiration, not only of, of the Bible, but a verbal inspiration of Ellen White as well. And even to the pioneers, um, you have another type of Adventism that is uh, progressive Adventism. You have an Adventism uh, that he t uh, coined as evangelical Adventism. And then he talks about something called biblical Adventism, which is still under development. And so I think it's, we, we should try to be clear when we say Adventists believe something, we, we need to remember that it's not all Adventists. It's, it's, it may be a, a very large or, or uh, a group, or it may be just a very vocal minority at times as well when we say that Adventists believe one thing or another. But I also wanted to just uh, interject that for me, Adventism cannot be reduced to, to its name. Uh, it's, mm. it's not just about the second coming. To me, Adventism is, is a matrix of, of doctrines and it is a meta narrative. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a worldview. Uh, that worldview being the great controversy and the, that matrix uh, or core matrix of doctrines, uh, uh, for at least for me, would be the, the sanctuary, the state of the dead, um, the Ten Commandments and the three angels messages. And if you have those core doctrines then you can reconstruct Adventism, the rest of the fundamental uh, beliefs. Uh, unfortunately, those different types of Adventists, they look at those doctrines and interpret them differently. And so they create slight variations, in some ways, major variations of that worldview of the great controversy, which leads to uh, oppression that, that uh, 
uh, Pastor Pilgrim was, was mentioning just a moment ago. Yeah. And, and, oh. and, and Ingram, it's very and what you're saying is profound, but it's very important that we see what is the undercurrent and the core theology. That is problematic. And I point that out because it is problematic. Mm -hmm. You know, the fundamental is all of these. For the most part, this is the common theology. All right? And, yeah, and, absolutely. And it is okay. Nothing wrong with it. But it becomes problematic when it becomes the basis of absconding our responsibility in the world. So that God's yeah. kingdom can come on earth as it is in heaven. So very right. definitely, very happy that you point that out that this is not a reduction of Adventism, but recognizing the mainstream undercurrent uh, that drives us and also uh, creates this problem where we cannot see that there are some fundamental social responsibilities that we cannot overlook. I want to make uh, absolutely. sure- Absolutely, and I think that- Let's go, uh, go One second, Sorry. I want to make sure Pastor Taylor can get in really oh, quick. I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll wait, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, I, I think, uh, Dr. Hemings pointed out that that escapist uh, type of uh, approach to theology is definitely a, a problem. Uh, for me, though, the root of it is really a denial of the great controversy and its implications. So the great controversy implies that people are free, that we have choices, that we have agency in the world, that we can act in the world, actually impact the world for either for whether good or evil. Um, but there are some Adventists among us who claim to believe the great controversy and all that it implies. But in reality, when it comes to social issues, they revert back to Calvinism, something that we came out of in, 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 uh, in New England. In, uh, uh, early, Can you say what Calvinism uh, is? Could you say So Calvinism is a worldview, and this, uh, this is probably unfair, but I'm just for the sake of this conversation, I'm just going to explain it very simply. So Calvinism is, is this worldview that God has basically determined everything beforehand. So none of us are actually free. Uh, if you ask a, a Calvinist whether we have freedom, they'll probably tell you yes, but we, and when you really look at it, we're not free. And so when you look at problems in society, you will quote scriptures that, like uh, the poor you will have with you always. And, and it's almost used as an excuse to say, well, God has predetermined these people to, to be poor. And so there's nothing that we can do about it. And so we, we, we pull back from society, which Dr. Hemings has, has uh, mentioned, and, and Pastor Pilgrim, and we pull back from society and we just throw up our hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do. All we can do is just prepare for the second coming because God is the only one who can fix this. But that type of theology actually denies the great controversy. The great controversy tells us that we have agency in the world and that we can actually impact it for good and fight against the oppressive forces like white supremacy and, and, and patriarchy and, and other uh, demonic forces that have uh, come into the world. So Pastor Taylor, I think you wanted to, wanted to add something? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, in my observation, um, I don't really think a lot of people know what we really teach. I mm. think they, they think they know what we teach, but at a core, um, a lot of that is very skewed by preferences and really practice. So mm -hmm. theology informs policy. This is where our church works. Then policy informs practice. But that's the way it should be. But what happens is Adventism has become such a culture uh, mm -hmm. that it goes the other way around. That practice informs policy and then policy informs theology. And so really, in my critique, there's no one source for our theology. Um, you, can't, you can't just go to these books. You can't just go to this resource that says, this is our complete theology. The church manual has one thing. The baptismal vows are another thing. You have to read all of the spirit of prophecy on one hand. Then you have to go to the 28 fundamental beliefs. You have to go to the biblical commentaries. It's, it, it will take you a lifetime. And for some of us who've had the privilege, I, I'm, I didn't have that privilege. I'm an Adventist by choice. So to, for some of us who's just been raised in the church, we know that there is a practice of Adventism. There's a culture of Adventism. And this is actually uh, what that is informed by. And so to really get a grasp on Adventism, um, it, it would take a lifetime, really, because there's so it's so nuanced, it's so deep, and it's so 
um, it's so rich in how it's applied and uh, practiced across the world. When we look at, like uh, Dr. Henry was saying, that theology is very contextual. And if we look at the context in which our church was birthed or which our church came about, there were a lot of things going on uh, in the world. I had never been taught the, the historical context of our church. I had never been taught uh, that our church was birthed in the context, context of the reconstruction. No one ever, no one ever shared that with me. I didn't ever, I never saw those things. I never saw uh, the contemporaries that Ellen White had through Harriet Tubman. I didn't know that William Miller was a contemporary of Nat Turner. I didn't know these things. And so when we look at the formation of our initial theological perspective, it was, there were certain people that were not at the table. It was not mm -hmm. fully informed. And so now we're reaching the point where we're wanting to do a, a critique of Adventism. For me, I love the church enough to critique it. Like mm -hmm. I love the church enough to tear it down and rebuild it. That's, that's me. Um, so now who's at the table, who needs to be at the table and who can be really critical about where our policy um, has supposedly been informed by our theology, but it's really been informed by our practice and really by our preferences in our churches. So most people, in my observation, don't have a, a depth, in-depth grasp on Adventist theology, including myself. I just put it out there because the more you study, the more you think it is, it is vast, it is exa exhaustive, and it, it takes a PhD to really understand uh, <laughs> what we teach. So, so, so to that, right. So can, can, uh, Adventist theology be decolonized, right? If it's, I mean, just that this, this whole notion of this whole program, can a, can, um, the various aspects of, uh, our Adventist theology, can it be decolonized? Uh, I would say yes, and I say it already has been, it already is being decolonized. I wholeheartedly believe in the brilliance of black thought. And I do not believe that blackness has ever been completely overcome or completely dominated. Um, I think blackness has a resilience to it that uh, has not been fully subdued uh, theologically. It takes a brilliant mind and brilliant theological lens to be a enslaved person that is not able to read, to be forced a gospel and a hermeneutic and a theology that is intent on keeping you captive, to hear through that and to do the theological work to have a picture of Jesus and to find Jesus in that, it's incredible theology, incredible brilliance. So I think, um, as I listened to the previous broadcast, that uh, I guess I'm not fully settled on the fact that Black thought has been colonized. I think that work mm. has been done and is being done, that we were not introduced to God here in this country. Uh, we were not even introduced to Christianity here in this country. Our Blackness was never smothered out. We never lost our connection to Africa and to our deep spirituality. Those things have run deep through us. Um, it's just that when we have associated ourselves so firmly uh, to one specific uh, denomination, we have with our lens, as Dr. Henry's uh, um, had mentioned the problematic, the deep, what is deeply problematic is our escapism and our eschatology, uh, basically putting those blinders up and not associating with anyone else. Our, our hermeneutic and our eschatology has taught us not to embrace the black church, the universal black church, but uh, I don't think black thought has ever fully been uh, colonized. So we have a, thank you for that. So in the in the chat uh there was a question uh could we talk about white christian republicans uh do you find that uh racist in a way or just navigating navigating that can i can i come in here uh perhaps i'm on a different wavelength and and very much profound what you said there um uh um uh, Pastor Terrence, uh, profound that yeah you can't read, but can we can we look at the uh, administrative structure of Adventism and see the extent to which that administrative structure may somewhat lend itself to the colonization <laughs> uh, to some extent? So maybe I'm thinking different. Let let's take for example because 
you know, I'm I'm in a particular struggle in Adventism where I see a a a, a tendency or an entrenched uh, patriarchy, which I think we inherited not from the gospel but from Roman um, imperialism. But I see that entrenched patriarchy there that is 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 at the center of a culture war in America, and I see where the powerful. Uh, who want to to win that war uh, on the side of patriarchy, uh, patriarchy? I see where they somewhat use um, our 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 sisters and brothers in Africa and also South America and so on. I see them being used as proxy. I don't know if you call that colonization, <laughs> um, but I see a, 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 a systemic colonization of of the colored peoples. Uh, of the world church in the interest of a culture war in America in which Adventism has embroiled itself, all right? A culture war, um, uh, you know, the culture war having to do with race, you know, sex, sexuality, all of that stuff. I see them being used as proxy. And I don't think they're even conscious of the extent to which when they come and they, you know, send their delegates and cast their votes, that they're really <laughs> being used in an American culture war. Um, because you go back to Africa and all this thing that they say the Africans are against women being ordained and so forth and so on, that's not, that's not the essence of African culture. African culture, <laughs> the, the traditional African culture, that's foreign to traditional African culture. So that colonization of Africa from way back when you know the west went down there uh, europe went down there and colonized them it's still there it's still around their necks and because we moved on america and europe somewhat culturally moved on they never came with it so now they go back to africa and wherever and and they use them as proxy to fight the culture war in america where you have those fundamentally somebody used it before strand um, of American Christianity with which we joined hands um, using them to fight that war. I don't know if you could call that colonization <laughs> uh, to some extent, but, but, but I worry about that because it, 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 looks, it seems problematic and, and, I, and I would like to see some kind of consciousness among our African you know, and even our other colored um, uh, sisters and brothers. I don't know what to think about that. But that, that, that other question that came from the from the uh, the chat may may follow up on that. Yes. Yeah, so so um, so you hear the terms like evangelicals, yeah. and you you uh, and we hear about Adventists that are even Republicans. So yeah. is there any? Um, can you can you be a follower of 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 Christ? And and be evangelical in the way in which it's it's propagated here in, in America, or uh, could you could you kind of unpack that? Because in some ways, I'm seeing in uh, predominantly white Adventist churches uh, an alignment with kind of the evangelical movement here in in the uh, in the United States. Yeah, that's what we're talking about the culture war. We have joined that culture war. That happened around 1919 when when the church felt that there was just there were just too many challenges to its uh, traditional doctrines and beliefs, and so it it, it thought it, that to, to safeguard its identity, it joined hands with fundamentalism. And if you notice, the reality is that white Seventh Day Adventists tend to vote differently from Black Seventh Day Adventists. So I'll end it there because whoever <laughs> among you are are actually Americans, you can take it up from there. You know, but but, but that, that's something important. Well, can I, I, can I, I comment I, on that? Or, go I, ahead. I, I'll say to, to one of Dr. Hemming's points um, as it pertains to um, the colonization of Black Christians or Black, especially Black Adventist Christians, I'll say I joined the church when I was 17 years old. I did not become aware of my Blackness until maybe five years ago. And that is because when I became an Adventist, my blackness was no longer an uh, essential part of me because what was mm. taught to me was that my Christianity overruled everything and that um, 
the theology that was taught to me at school and at my church was um, it was a very Eurocentric theology. Let's just put it that way. So blackness uh, that was taught to me, my blackness did not matter. I, I lost the sense of the importance of my blackness, the struggle of my blackness. Listen, I didn't realize I was black. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, like I, I forgot who I was. And, and in some ways we are taught that our, 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 our identity as black people is not in, as important as our identity as Christian. And to me, that's a problem. And before I didn't know it was a problem, until now I realized that is a problem. Because, I'm sorry to say this, but our white brothers and sisters don't lose their identity when they become a Christian. They don't lose mm. it, as they do. And, and so I, I dare say that, yes, I think that within our black churches uh, and our, even Caribbean, uh, you know, I come from a Caribbean topic as well, that <laughs> what we teach, the hermeneutics that we teach, is a very Eurocentric hermeneutic. And we lose ourselves uh, with that, within that hermeneutics that's taught. I'll also say that the fundamentalist uh, community within our Adventist church and, and the alignment with the event, evangelical community, um, <laughs> it's, hmm. it's the, the prominent thing is more, as, as Pastor Karen says, is that our practice is really more informing how we behave than our biblical our theology. Right, mm. so we are aligning ourselves with parties, or let's just say the Republican Party, as the person made a comment to, simply because we are looking for the government to mandate our biblical theology. Yes, mm -hmm. right. We want the government to tell the LGBTQI community that what they're doing is wrong. We want the government to legislate that um, people cannot have the choice to to marry the same sex or to have an abortion. Yet, we allow the same government to oppress a multitude of communities because the only thing that we care about is children who are unborn, but we don't care about the children who are born. We are mm. aligning ourselves with, uh, uh, with uh, a sense of thinking and we're using the government to do our job or to do, to, to do biblical stuff. And that's, that's not what the Bible's called us to. As, as um, Ingram said, that... The great controversy, God gives us agency. God does not force us to or force us to, to love him or force us to, to, to do his will. He gives us choice and love has a choice. And when we use the government to mandate what people should do, that is not the gospel and that is not God. I'll, I'll end there for now. Mm. Mm. Can somebody come to, back yeah. to my question yeah. now? <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll come back after Dr. London. I want to just to add a little bit to going back to the question that was in the comments in regards to uh, white Republicans and, and different things within uh, Adventism and within Christianity. I think what we see, at least in Adventism, is not unique to Adventism. I think it happens in every denomination that has a mixture of, of races, especially here in North America, predominantly uh, white. Uh, uh, individuals, uh, but also with black and brown individuals, is that there's going to be this this uh, this disconnect between those different communities. They're going to read the Bible differently. They're going to experience God uh, differently. But what I want to say is that, if, especially for 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 black Christians, black Christians, in in my opinion, are really the conscience and the prophetic voice of Christianity in North America. We yes. are, I believe that God actually uses the black church to call the white church to repentance and to hold them accountable for the things that they have deemed as uh, right and, and truth and, and, and things that they have looked over and, and, and tried to, to, to repaint or, or airbrush as, as being acceptable to God. Uh, I mean, we can talk about a, a, a whole host of things that, uh, the the transatlantic slave trade of, of course uh in our in our own experience but also the experience of native americans and their genocide and and and, and uh basically just being disenfranchised from from their lands and territories um and we can talk about american imperial imperialism as well so it, it is to me it's the black and the brown voices within north america that that hold the christian church here accountable uh, for its actions, and it's the same today, even today in our current climate. So I don't want to necessarily condemn 
or, or demonize all, all Republicans, not all Republicans think alike, not all Democrats think alike, but there is something that is that we are seeing right now in our culture where it, it appears that uh, a lot of right-wing, white, Christian evangelicals, they appear to be very comfortable with xenophobia, with white supremacy, mm. And all of these different things, and it and it's actually falls on us uh, as as our responsibility as Black Christians and especially as Black Adventists to call out uh, the, those types of behaviors and and thoughts uh, and 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 theology, and especially us as Black Adventists because when we look at our eschatology, our eschatology was not colonized in the beginning, and you're seeing a lot of people doing this retrieval work right now of looking at. Some of the things that our pioneers wrote, some of the things that um, Ellen White wrote, uh, one of our, our principal founders, and they're going back and finding things that really are the seeds of, of a black liberation theology within Adventism. But because of that pivot that we made in, in, 19, in the early 1900s into fundamentalism, and because Adventism has this ongoing love affair with evangelicals of trying to be accepted with evangelicals, and they keep telling us we're just not that into you, but we just don't want to accept that, that message from them. We keep trying to win them over. And so for that reason, black issues and brown issues are never uh, a subject of discussion to, to be brought up in the church uh, at large. You know, I would want to hoping to share um, uh, something that, you know, whiteness about whiteness. I think um, to really be clear about what whiteness is as a social construct, uh, construct versus white people or people who choose to participate in the whiteness project. So whiteness is a project. Whiteness is a is a social construct that was created in order to perpetuate uh, what this country is founded on. Um, there were individuals who were not white when they came to this country, but mm -hmm. whiteness was an opportunity. It was the intersection of theology, politics, economics, race, sexuality. And so people could become white that were Italian, could, be, could become white that were Teach. French. Um, so whiteness is an option. Uh, it's not it's not a ethnicity. It's a concept. And um, unfortunately, those who have been kissed by nature's son uh, or those who are, are not white passing uh, cannot participate in that project in the same way. But we have to acknowledge in what ways we have participated in whiteness. So whiteness mm. has informed the religion and the theology of this country. You have to have a whiteness uh, that is informed in order to uh, even have the type of religion that we what, to say to justify a slave a slavery concept, a slavery idea. Like you have to have a theology to do that. You have to say, as uh, London brought up Calvinism, that. Um, there are some people who are pure. There are some people who are just desperately wicked and destitute and, and need to be saved. Um, and so that project of whiteness began even before slavery. You have to have that in order to even justify slavery and lose your humanity. Uh, the danger is um, that the majority of white America is unaware of that project, unaware of that construct and how they are contributing to it. And so the... Um, to think that theology is not connected to politics is a void. Uh, we all know that black theology has always been deeply steeped in politics. Um, and so as black Adventists specifically, Adventism has been informed by whiteness. Ah. And Adventism has become a social construct that you can participate in because uh, and Black Adventists have to acknowledge the fact of how have we participated in that project. If you were to study on Black Adventists, <laughs> most of us have taken advantage of uh, the, um, the really the, um, the uh, classism that Adventist brings us. Most of yep. us are educated upper class Black people. We're not poor Black people. And we don't yeah. do well with poor Black people. We're, we're a little bougie when you get down to it. And so yeah. we have participated in whiteness. I had to struggle uh, as a black American with acknowledging the whiteness that is in me. So how do I participate in that project and understanding that? So when it comes to evangelicalism, uh, London is right. They're, they're not going to accept us to use this term. Uh, Adventism is a very queer version of evangelicalism. 
Um, that's the way they see us. There are certain doctrine things, doctrinal things that don't make us normative by using that term uh, from queer theology that acknowledges what normativity is and rejects what is normativity, which has typically been white, patriarchal, as she mentioned, uh, Dr. Hennings mentioned, patriarchal, uh, Christian, you know, heteronormative uh, religion. Um, we have a very, you know, our second coming doctrine, our doctrine on the state of the dead. Those are a direct conflict with evangelicalism. So um, as people participate in politics uh, and as evangelicals, I'm going to uh, mention a book later, um, but I'll just bring it up now. This book, this new book by Todd DeLay against what does the white evangelical wants, a great source to kind of break down evangelicalism and their marriage with politics. Uh, but politics is an idea A Republican it, Republican ideology is an idea. Democratic ideology is an idea. And you can choose to participate in where you want. I live in a very right-leaning Republican Trump supporting area. That's where I'm doing my work in this, yes. in this context. I'm in a state conference. Uh, I'm not in a regional conference. Uh, I'm doing regional work in a state conference. So I have to be very aware of those things. I just don't think the majority of white Adventists would see themselves as perpetuating uh, what they're perpetuating by their vote. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's the truth is where Adventism is informed by whiteness. It has been informed by way. And if we're going to take the courage to not only deconstruct that, but also challenge the ways in way black Adventism is perpetuating whiteness and in our own social context, uh, then we can really start from there. Yeah. Uh, and that's where we begin to decolonize Adventist theology. Very good. Eh? It's very, very good. Yeah. So, so uh, pa Pastor Pilgrim, were you about to say something? Well, I was going to say that leads us into our question of do we need a black theology? Yeah. So, is there, can there be a, such a thing as a black Adventist theology? Well, <laughs> you, well, you know, this is the thing. I, I, if I may go back to say that we have he inherited, like all the other <laughs> Christian denominations or whatever, we have inherited a colonized Christianity. And I always like to go back to the fourth century when Rome hijacked the gospel and made it a religion of Christianity, which was really an instrument of, uh, of Roman imperialism domination, control. Later, of course, it became the instrument of, of European colonial expansionism. That's what we have inherited. We have not inherited the gospel. The gospel was a liberation movement. Mm. Um, remember that mm. what the, Jesus and the early church was trying to do, they were trying to say that the liberation that comes to the Abrahamic covenant, the liberation of the promise of Messiah is not only to Jews, especially just Jewish males, mm -hmm. you know, and so what the church was practicing something radical. You read Romans 16, you see all the women in there, female apostles, you saw a slave, Tertius, who was the one who signed off on the letter to the Romans, slave, all of, they had brought the, um, you go to Acts and, 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 and Philip goes to the Ethiopian eunuch. Peter is sent to the home of the Gentiles. These are unclean people. These are outcasts in, <laughs> in, in the economy of Israel. So what you had there was a liberation gospel and that gospel was eclipsed because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the church was first and foremost part of the synagogue. The early church began in the synagogues. You know that. They didn't leave the synagogues. They were like kicked out of the synagogues. And because they were kicked out, they start meeting separately. That's when the separation began and the church slowly evolved or perhaps devolved into a public structure. And, and then the, all the big shots came in and finally Rome saw this as just the religion to unify the empire and just the religion through which it could advance its, uh, its um, imperialist project. So what we have inherited is that uh, a, a, a Christianity that is a colonizing religion. Mm. We have lost the gospel. And so because we have lost the gospel, that's why we need all these liberation theologies today. What we are attempting to do is to go back to the gospel that include all of, included all of us. Mm -hmm. So when we actually go back to the gospel, <laughs> you know, pre-Roman colonization of the gospel, pre-Roman hijacking of the gospel, 
then perhaps we can begin to talk about a theology that's inclusive, where we don't have to be seeking for a black theology within Adventism or anywhere else, or a womanist or feminist theology and so forth. I hope I'm not throwing a monkey wrench into the conversation, but that, that, that is where it all begins, you know, uh, there, the gospel. I would agree with Dr. Higgs. The gospel is black theology. <laughs> yeah. we, don't, we don't have to create it. It's already there. Yeah. Uh, we just have to give ourselves permission to, uh, to relate to a God in our blackness and to love blackness enough to embrace the gospel. Um, so the, 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 if you look at Christ, well, I guess if you look at Christ, from whatever lens you're looking at Christ from, uh, the gospel is liberative. I don't know where we got to the point where the gospel did not become liberative. It is liberative. Yeah. Uh, Christ was a marginalized person. Christ was an oppressed person. He chose uh, to really come into the world, as you would know, Cone would say, as a black person, the black Christ. We have been uh, so familiar in this relationship with a, a white Jesus. And I say that a Jesus steeped in whiteness. And uh, we have accepted that so, so long that we have lost sight of the, the true Christ that came. Well, I should say the Jesus that came, the universal Christ that came through uh, the embodied Christ as Jesus, um, that the, the gospel is liberative. And here's what I here's what I firmly believe, that nobody owns the church. Hmm. Nobody owns the church and, and no one can say this is who we are and this is not who we are. Uh, we choose to participate and worship God in the way that we are made to worship and choose to worship God, but nobody owns the church. And so we have to take back uh, that that mantle and say, what does how does Adventist practice theology uh, and, and and everything else? How does it help black people? That's the question I'm starting. It was, is Adventism good for black people? That's my question. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is it good for us or not? Yeah, the preaching the gospel is good for us. As long as they're preaching the gospel. <laughs> Are we preaching the gospel? Wait. Uh oh, oh can, I, can I piggyback off of that? Terrence makes a Yeah. Good. He says, not only do we not own the gospel, but, not, uh, but we don't own the truth, right? So, right. Often is we tend to think that we own the truth, we have the truth. We don't own truth either. And to your question, oh, there's a few things I want to mention. To your question is, is Adventism good for black people? Uh, let me say this. In the in the 60s, black Christians did not experience um, their, they weren't uh, encouraged by the church. Black people were encouraged by the, the nation of Islam. It was the nation of Islam that told black people that they were beautiful, that they were strong, that they were powerful, that they were somebody, that they had some somebody-ness as, as Martin Luther King Jr. would say. So it, it, we received uh, uh, encouragement and upliftment and liberation uh, by the message of the Nation of Islam movement. And so the question is, is the, is, is the Adventist church good for black people? Well, when you have a, a leader of the Adventist movement who says that there are some social issues that we should not get involved with. Uh oh. Then we have to question ourselves: How in the world are we a part of such a movement when even the head and and a lot of the the the, the other leaders, you know, the black church, the Adventist church is predominantly a, a black church, and our representation, as it seems to leadership, is, has never represented us as a people. Mm -hmm. And the question in in the, the comment below it says: How do we continue to attend and and financially support the current Adventist structure, even though it perpetuates injustice. The question is, is, the, is our current system good for our people? But, but can I say this in terms of, you know, I always say, uh, and you know, we always try to point to Silver Spring as a problem. Church is, Silver Spring is not where the church is. See, this is, we're doing church right now. See, church is where the people are. And that's where I keep saying to people, that's where church is. I, I, I support my local congregation because it's a, a congregation that is conscious about social justice, that is conscious about inclusivity and so forth. So we, we, we <laughs> and, 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 I, and I feel you, Daniel, but we got to 
we have to know where church really is, not in Silver Spring. So can, can, I, can, I, can I can I can I address that? So there would someone would say that even though I invest in my local church and my local church engages in acts of social justice, can I, in all good conscience, financially support a system? Because ultimately, if I'm paying, if I am returning, excuse me, not paying, returning my tithe to a system that ultimately at the top is not invested in who I am, so yeah, I can say my local church is is doing the work and I can say, yeah, I'm doing the local church is doing it, but I am part of a larger larger ecosystem, a larger system. Should I continue to invest my dollars into a system that does not respect me or respect who who I am as a as a child of God and does and won't say Black Lives Matter? <laughs> Yeah, I, I can address that. I, I, I think um, I personally, my opinion is I don't really have uh, I haven't started with my critique of the system as itself, the way our church works. I think our church has the fluidity to uh, to really adapt and to to, to change and to. Um, so in other words, I don't think like talking specifically about local church conference union and how the funds are distributed because really that just comes down to funds really what we're talking about is resources at, at the at the end of it it's really how the funds are stewarded and resourced um but at the local level as uh, dr Hemis mentioned earlier we do have the mobility and the fluidity to do what we need i'm not looking for statements uh from those those leaders um i don't think that's their view i don't think that's uh really their their role i don't see their role as doing that as church administrators it would be nice uh it would be great to have that to hear black lives matter but uh i rather them not lie to me or do mm. false truth and to be authentic to where they're positioned and where they're from um we have enough tools and again this is about taking full agency of the churches we do have yeah. taking full agency of the institutions we already have of our schools mm. of our hospitals and really saying, answering that question, you know, going back to that, is Adventism good for black people? Is the version that we present. Um, if it's informed and, and created to affect other people, then it probably isn't. But I know that uh, pastors, my own colleagues, have fought strongholds within their own black churches who are supposed to be uh, ministering to black people and have so many barriers to change uh, that can't even move. Um, any of their churches to even do things for black people in their own black community. So um, I think the church will respond as we organize and embody ourselves better and put people in positions in leadership. We have to say things like, who do we want to be the next conference president of a state conference? Mm. Like this is yeah. the pastor here that we're going to groom and we're going to train to do that. We're going to be intentional about putting our people in leadership. These are the women that we are going to employ and put them in positions so that they're eligible for leadership. So there are some things we can do from the ground up. And um, just from my experience uh, recently of being on the executive committee for my union and learning the church from that perspective, uh, I've had a different view of how the church works. And there are a lot of opportunities that we can shift and change and do what's good for us, even with the system. Now, if it's, is it perfect? No, but we can work with it. Um, so my critique has not started there. My critique is more started with uh, my own black theological lens. Yeah. And, and if I may say, we, we begin to colonize, decolonize Adventist theology when each of us own the church. Yeah. I each like of that. us must own this church. I like that. And there are a few, there are some in this church who'd like to think that it belongs to them and their worldview <laughs> and their way of doing things. Don't worry about those. We all must own this church from wherever we come because who is it that pointed it out so beautifully? That Adventism is this a vast and multifaceted uh, movement of people. We all don't think the same way. We all don't, uh, you know, we have some fundamental things that we all agree on. Mm -hmm. But we do our Adventist theology differently, all of us coming from where we stand. We must all 
own this church as ours. There's a queer young lady that was saying, I'm moving out of the church. I said, you, this is your church. You stand up and fight. You don't move out. This is your church. Don't let somebody tell you, you can't stay in it or you can't be in it. Don't worry about the policies that the church is, uh, 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 is, 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 is um, uh, passing or whatever to exclude you. If you get up and fight somehow, someday, maybe not be in your lifetime, but you're just being here and making yourself, owning this movement is going to change it somehow. So, you know, that's just what I want to throw out there. Own this church. It's yours. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ch Dr. Freeman, Pilgrim, if, did you... if... Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to go back to the question real quick that, uh, that Pastor Taylor brought up. Is, is Adventism good for Black people? And I just wanted to say that um, in its current form, and as I was uh, uh, brought up earlier in regards to fundamentalist Adventism, evangelical Adventism, those brands, which I would say are aberrations of true Adventism, biblical Adventism, no, those are not good for Black people. But there is a biblical Adventism that needs to be constructed that I mm. think is and will oh. be good for Black people. Like um, as I have studied Black theology, I've notice some some gaps in 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 the in the research some gaps in the literature some some problems some inconsistencies that i think that adventism actually has something to contribute because of our worldview and because of some some key doctrines that we understand such as the state of the dead such as uh the sanctuary um and the great great controversy worldview that these things can inform uh black theology black liberation theology black theodicy uh, which is my particular interest and and actually impacted in a very powerful way so that black people what is, what is the the odyssey what sorry, is the yeah. odyssey so, so <laughs> yeah sorry about that. so the odyssey is essentially the it's like a, a justification or defense of god uh in light mm. of the problem of evil so the it's called the the epicurean uh paradox that you have these these truths that we want to hold on to these attributes of god that god is omnipotent he's all powerful we also believe that god is omnibenevolent he's all loving but yet we still uh experience in in our life in our world uh the the problem of sin and pain and evil and horrendous evils at that and so it's trying to reconcile this idea how can god be all all powerful how can we all be all loving and yet we have the holocaust and yet we have mm. the transatlantic slave trade and these types of things. So Black Theodicy is trying to address what is it, what is going on, how can God actually love, uh, how can we claim that God loves Black people, how can we claim that God is all is all powerful, and yet we are still suffering, and, and what about the suffering in the past as well? So that's what Black Theodicy is trying to address, and there are a lot of problems in Black Theodicy even today and uh, in, in the academic circles. And I think that Adventism has something to contribute there to allow for us to have a God that is all powerful, that is all loving and actually has a special regard for black people and their sufferings and, and yet be able to, to say that uh, at the end of the day that we can still trust that God. And uh, Pastor London, uh, someone put it in the uh, comments, Facebook comments, uh, a question directly to you regarding some of those gaps. I know you mentioned quickly a few. Could you talk about a few of the gaps uh, that you notice in uh, Black liberation theology? Yeah, so Black liberation theology, uh, I can I can speak more to Black theodicy than Black liberation uh, theology, so I'll, I'll do that instead, but I'll point out some of those gaps. So it, in Black uh theodicy, you have multiple approaches. You have people like Anthony Carter, who comes from a reformed uh, Protestant perspective, that Calvinist perspective that we talked about earlier, where he sees the transatlantic slave trade as the will of God, that it was decreed by God since uh, before time, and that it was God's will for black people to go through that experience. And he says the purpose of that experience was to re-Africanize Christianity. So to take a group of black people, take them out of Africa, bring them to North America, expose them uh, to Christianity, and by that way, actually re-Africanize Christianity. And that's, that's his black theodicy. That is his 
uh, as his way of explaining why God would allow the transatlantic slave trade. Now, for I think for me and probably for most Adventists, that is a horrible answer. <laughs> that is a horrible reason. And why would anyone even want to worship a God like that? It, it really speaks to someone who doesn't actually uh, understand what happened in during chattel slavery and during the transatlantic slave trade. But then you have other individuals who have something that's very close to a, a an Adventist perspective uh, that, that you would say, where they they see that Christ is actually at war with uh, white supremacy and, and all these different things. But a lot of the problems that you'll see is that a lot of black theologians are trained in what, I, for lack of a better term, liberal schools and using liberal uh, hermeneutics. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of times you'll see in their theology a denial of the existence of a personal devil. And without the existence of a personal devil, really their theology, their theodicies fall apart because who is Christ actually at, at war with and how is it that creatures are able to withstand the, the power of Christ without having the great controversy motif there and without uh, an actual real personal devil, things that we could bring to that conversation and, and defend, uh, I think, successfully. Uh, black theology, theodicy has some real problems right now that, that, could, that we could address. Wow. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, one of the uh, one of the major names that I uh, may have heard once or not heard uh, in our discussing yet is Ellen White. And so after the break, we're going to we're going to uh, uh, talk about how uh, what Ellen White, her her messages and things like that may influence this discussion around what a black Adventist theology uh, would would look like. Uh, so I think we, this has been awesome uh, so far. We've gotten some great questions from our audience. I would ask them to uh, continue to uh, develop those, those questions and post those questions because in the second half, uh, we're going to take uh, we're going to take some of uh, take some of those, um, uh, but I wanted to to let you know about something that's uh, coming up that's special uh, next month, and you'll definitely not want to miss it. Um, it. It's called Decolonizing the Black Mind Summit, which will start on Thursday night, November nineteenth, and culminate on Sabbath afternoon, November twenty one. Uh, some some great speakers will be with us, including Dr. Wesley Knight, uh, Pastor Lola, Lola Moore Johnston, Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn, Pastor Kimberly Bulgin, Pastor Marquise Johns, Dr. Lorena Ray, Pastor Joshua McPunga, and Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst. This is going to be a power-packed event that you don't want to miss. Uh, to keep up to date regarding the details of the summit, please go to my website, www.drsydneyfreemanjr.com. Again, it's www.drsydneyfreemanjr.com. And my and for others, go to my professional webpage and uh, face. Uh, excuse me, my professional uh, Facebook page. Uh, and like the page so you can stay up with all the developments re related to the summit uh, at uh, www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. Uh, www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. I would also ask everyone to go to my YouTube channel uh sydney freeman jr and subscribe you guys did a wonderful job uh last month doing that and we had 212 we had 212 uh individuals who uh at that time who were subscribed we got over 100 is is at this moment i believe it's 313 subscribers we're trying to reach 500 subscribers so please uh if you have not um, if you have not uh, subscribed to our, our YouTube channel, please do that. We have about 30, uh, original, 
uh, pieces of video uh, content that uh, we would love for you to have access to. We have a range of speakers that I've interviewed uh, about uh, various issues around the theme of decolonizing the black Adventist mind or the black or the black mind. So please do that uh, when you when you can. Uh, so to facilitate a program uh, such as such as this, it costs. Uh, my wife and I have made a covenant with God that uh, that we were going to support this program. Uh, however, however, we are not we are not funded by uh, a particular church or a conference or a division. Uh, this is a ministry uh, that we've uh, now. Uh, named as the liberation movement that is uh, moving forward uh, to support the I, the concept of decolonizing uh, the Adventist decolonizing the Adventist mind. And so, if you're enjoy if you're enjoying uh, the ministry that is that is being brought brought forth, I would I would encourage you to donate uh, to our to our ministry. Uh, in a few moments, you'll see uh, various ways that you can uh, donate to the ministry, whether it's via uh, Venmo, uh, Venmo and Cash App, and and PayPal. There will be there are multiple ways that you can give. I'm so thankful that uh, we had uh, had had people that uh, sacrificing gave. Uh, uh, last month, it was it allowed us to cover our costs with regard to audiovisual uh, needs and uh, to prepare for this uh, this broadcast. So your gifts allow us to keep this to keep the level of quality of programming going. And so uh, please please do that if you feel if you feel so moved. So we're going to take a, a less than two minute break and we'll be right back. Uh, to answer some of the questions that you guys are putting in the comments in the chat. Thank you. All right. Well, I think our, I think you would agree that that uh, the panel discussion has been uh, excellent so far, and we're looking forward, uh, looking forward to this second half. What we've asked our our presenters to to do is to put their social media handles uh, in in place of their names, just so you would be able to follow them, follow them in their ministries. Uh, in the future. And so we're so thankful and glad to have uh, each of them with us. Um, so now we're going to move uh, into the second half of 
of our questions if they can if they can come back up awesome 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 so we said that we're going to we're going to evoke Ellen White's name we can't talk about Adventist theology and not bring her name in the mix so I have this question here uh, and the question is how do we respond to those theologians who say that Ellen White's 1891 sermon rebuke to the general conference via the uh, quote our duty to the color people actually blackened Adventists so intensely that she and it was exiled what were the themes of that sermon and how did they destabilize the status quo so i'll i'll throw that out uh to pastor taylor all right hey just while we're at the break i just want to say thank you again uh to be on the on this with all the panels panelists i've been learning so much from y'all this has been an incredible conversation and thank you for those who are uh typing in the chat we're trying to keep up uh but yeah this is a pretty yeah. heavy this is a pretty heavy question this is a pretty heavy thing um i'll start with a couple observations um first it is 1891 uh and to look at uh, the historical context of 1891, this is, you know, uh, the Reconstruction, this is post-emancipation proclamation, this is kind of uh, where uh, the, the country is, is sensitive and and really the, the white church is having to shift theologically now, right? They have to uh, do different work to maybe perpetuate those in the South, their ideas. So they have to do some work. And it's interesting to follow how in that era, a lot of people are looking, um, as Dr. Nini say, for an escapist route, looking for eschatology as a way to keep their eyes on Jesus and not on the people that are around them. And uh, then you have to look at um, this idea. My other observation is, you know, like this conversation, there are some conversations that uh, white, white individuals need to have with white individuals and there needs to be conversation with a white and black. And then there's conversations with black and black, which we're kind of having, but since we're live, it's hard to really have that conversation. And I think in, in this particular um, letter or sermon she writes is not written to a black audience. It's not centered to black people. So this, this, this sermon is written to her colleagues and peers in the church. At this point, black leadership is not involved and in the context of Adventism. When you think about when Adventism launched, right? You talk about, we, you like those terms, those uh, dates of 1844 to 1891. I mean, that's a long time for black people to not really necessarily be deeply involved in the church. The church at this point has already kind of come together. And then um, the idea that this is a this is a sermon, and not so much a theological work. Now, what mm. makes this question different difficult, uh, Doc, is how people view Ellen White. Do they view her as a theologian? Do they view her as a commentary? So, is do we treat this as a theological work? Uh, done by an Adventist theologian? Uh, do we see this as a theological work, work done as a female Adventist theologian? And what are the sensibilities that are connected to that? And how is that informed? I think uh, historically, I did a little bit of work on this back in seminary, Andrews. It's been a long time. Uh, but hmm. Ellen White, to use the Australian term, uh, my friend, uh, she was getting a little cheeky already. Ellen White was already starting to get uh, you know, a little frustrated with where the church was. And she was at this point, I'm sure anybody in their eighties is speaking their mind right at this point. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's just like when I was wanted to, had to go to seminary, I didn't want to go there by choice at the time, but it was God's will. And I think her, her move to Australia was this, was this push for mission. And I think her critique ultimately surrounding this and maybe not explicit in the letter or the sermon is that, missions was under the mm, was under the code of colonization empire so mission mm. mission was our version of colonization but it was also to really escape the work that was right there and i think ellen white was saying there is a work 
to be done here. Now, I do not think while we see this as a catalyst for the black work, we obviously know that God was already working with individuals. We already know that when God gives vision to her for Oakwood and all those kind of things that we love so much, uh, we do know that's God's work. But we do know uh, historically that is in the context of building black institutions and re kind of rebuilding black people. So this work, I mean, I don't think anybody, historians are going to outright say that she was sent to Australia because of these comments, but <laughs> I think it's highly possible. I think they were having enough of her anyway, and I think that she does vocalize and lift a sensibility that the church is ignoring the colored people in the South as a mission opportunity, and I don't know if in good conscience, conscious, these white northern Adventists really wanted too much to do with the South in the first place, post Civil War and post uh, Reconstruction. Uh, but it's an excellent uh, that I was going to mention blackhistory.com. If the money wants to do a quick thing, that's uh, by Ben Baker, I think his website, you can go and check out that. Uh, so yeah, that duty to the color South thing goes into the Southern work and uh, it, it kind of gets lost in the archives and uh, it's not really considered. So the question really sending is do is she a theologian? Is she doing this work right. as a theologian, as a commentary, as an administrator? And how do we approach her from there? Can I can I respond to that question? There? Yes, please. You know, as I read the sermon, I feel I'm reading sections from Gustavo Gutierrez. Ever heard of Gustavo Gutierrez? He's a father of liberation theology. Yes, yes, yes. And remember I said theology does isn't passed down to us in some formal work. Theology actually begins with the preaching, the sermons, <laughs> and the proclamations based on what is happening. So I feel, if you read Gustavo Gutierrez, and there's a, a particular theme in Gutierrez's work, we talk about God's preferential option for the poor. And this is the major theme of Ellen White's sermon. She says God is partial towards the poor and the powerless. And she invokes Jesus of Nazareth, his own background, his own life and ministry. He comes not from a rich and powerful background. He, his um, disciples were not the rulers, the scribes, the Pharisees, and so forth. And then she calls upon the church and she says, if you cannot see that your ministry must be geared towards these who are the least esteemed in society, you have not yet begun to practice the gospel. So it was like a judgment. As I say, I felt I was reading Gutierrez. And, <laughs> and uh, um, as to the question uh, of, of, of whether she was banished to Australia as a result, it seems to be <laughs> the popular <laughs> belief, uh, the hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, <laughs> it's a hermeneutic of suspicion. Why is mm. it that she got suddenly sent to Australia? Uh, but I would say it's God's providence. Uh, and I don't know if this is a place to say it, but you know, even Arthur White himself, is it her grandson, great grandson? He wrote a history um, of Helen White. And Arthur White even read a hermeneutic of suspicion into the fact that just before she was going to Australia, it, somehow by divine providence, they noticed that something was going on with the wheel of her, her wagon. And if the driver didn't notice it, it would have been sure death for her. Wow. And it would seem that that was purposely tampered with. Mm. So what I'm trying to say here is that Ellen White really rocked the boat. Because here she's talking about black people. These are God's people. They're going to heaven just like you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then they didn't think slaves had the spiritual agency or capacity to get into heaven. So, and then she was putting judgment on the church and she was judging the church and its true mission and whether it was really doing God's will based on the extent to which they were treating and regarding colored people as having, uh, uh, deserving the gospel. So, yes, um, that's perhaps not one of the bright and shining moments in Adventist history. And yet it was bright and shining because Ellen White got to go down to Australia and do some great work down there. Mm -hmm. And the work to the colored people actually uh, began. And I like uh, Sydney, what you and Maury did uh, on, on, uh, on the work there and your reference to it. Yes. 
Yeah, so we didn't we didn't get to give you a chance to respond to that in the first part. Could you kind of respond maybe to some of that or some of what we said in that piece? Yeah, what 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 is the specific question you're asking again? So we were we were asking mm -hmm. that and we were asking it in the context of we were we kind of alluded to the notion for the need of a black Adventist theology. Yes. Um, could you talk about uh, one? We asked earlier if if there was a black Adventist theology or if there was a need for it, and then if if it is, what would that look like? Yeah, and, and I think one one of the things you pointed out in your in your work at the Zuan Publishing Adventist today is that already the experience of black people in America was an experience that, uh, that, that, that instilled in them that, that urgency that of, the, of the return uh, of Christ to deliver them from their suffering. So what you were saying that they didn't introduce Adventism to black people. Black people were already right. Adventists. Mm -hmm. They were already hoping and expecting an end to the suffering that they were undergoing. And, and, and I think what you wanted to bring out, you and Maura wanted to bring out, is that it's not as though, you know, they came and they brought to the black people something that, that wasn't already part of their experience, part of their hope, part of the very fabric of their, 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 their experiences and the life they were living. And you go back to the whole point of theology. They already had a theology well developed as far as their suffering was concerned. Um, so so, so uh, actually the work to the colored people, that sort of uh, uh, bring them in uh, to an experience where they were able to, if you may uh, continue that, uh, Sydney, uh, how did they then bring them into the Adventist experience? They already uh, having that lived experience, that hope um, within them as a result of their life. Can I piggyback here? Um, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I think there's an urgency. Um, I think what we need is what I hear on this panel is we need black Adventist theologians. And mm. I think there's a sense of urgency or we're going to lose a generation, not yeah. only of young people, but of young black people who the, the problem is people, the way they're presented um, Christianity and faith, they don't black people don't typically see themselves in the scripture. They don't see themselves in the church. Um, they're not hearing themselves in the stories. They don't see themselves in the storybooks or illustrations or, at, you know, any of our evangelistic meetings. They don't, it doesn't, and it's not, we're not just talking about uh, colorism. We're not just talking about artwork, you know, and imagery, although that's important. We're talking about, I don't see my issue. I don't see my struggle. Um, I see a dominant narrative in how we think about politics and I don't see my struggle. So I really think we need black Adventist theologians like on this call, on this panel to, to do something because I think that this, this next generations are, are really fed up and they're tired of the church not responding to their issues. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter and what that, what that means to the Adventist church, but we've got to do something quickly. We've got to get some churches uh, that are intentionally built around rescuing and providing the space for um, all of our black families and people to find home and to really do that work that uh, my colleagues here on the, on this uh, panel are doing. So Can I, I also make comment on that, or if okay. we have time, I don't, I, I just uh, uh, ex extend that even more that uh, I think I mentioned it earlier as well, that we, we need to engage in uh, a retrieval project of actually bringing back some of the arguments that our pioneers use in, in uh, articulating our eschatology. So, what, what I mean by that is that it, when you go to a typical Seventh-day Adventist prophecy seminar, when we identify the, the second beast of Revelation 13, we usually point to the United States, but we say that it will one day become the beast of Revelation uh, of 13, the land, uh, the land beast. Uh, and that will only happen when it passes uh, a, a national Sunday law to try and force the conscience of individuals in a particular manner of worship. But that is not what our pioneers taught. Our pioneers yeah. actually taught that, yes, that will be an important manifestation of its beast-like power, but yeah. it is already beastly. 
because mm-hmm. you can you can be a member of a Christian church in the United States during that time, a member in good standing and own slaves. Yes. And they connected that idea with Revelation uh, 17 and 18, the identity of, of, of Babylon, the, the great the, the mother of harlots that talks about the trafficking in, in human lives. And that, com- that, that combination of, of connecting Revelation 17 and 18, the, the harlot uh, of Babylon, and also that second beast of Revelation 13, that was also a part of our prophetic heritage. But you don't hear that message anymore uh, because our church has changed its, its, its teachings, at, at least in, in that regards, because of pressure from the United States government and the FBI and other investigations. And you can look at the work of uh, Kevin Burton, who's at Southern uh, Adventist University. And I believe that's also part of his dissertation work that he's uh, trying to finish up there. But uh, again, I, I think we need to engage in a retrieval project of, of recapturing some of the things that our pioneers taught that will, that will connect with black people today to recognize that the United States will not one day become the beast, it is already the beast. And you can uh. call out some of its beastly nature even now in, in regards to uh, issues like white supremacy and, and its conflict with Black Lives Matter. Chaplain Pilgrim, were you, were you going to interject something? I was, but now that you mentioned that, I, I, I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that in some ways we are perpetuating the beast qualities that we're talking about, right? Oh, if, wow. if our theology um, is, continues to be the way it is, then we are in some sense the beast, right? And, and, oh. and, and to me, when it comes to the solution and changing, it, for me, it goes back to, I, I know it starts bottom up, but the reason why we're at the bottom has a, a problem, the local church has a problem in really doing the gospel is because they have been taught from the top um, what, you know, we've been taught a certain type of gospel. So that's why we are inactive in our community. In, in our seminaries, we're taught a certain type of gospel, a certain type of evangelism. Um, you know, our evangelism methods are really to the uh, to the middle class. Uh, when it comes to the poor, mm-hmm. we look at the poor as, you know, <laughs> you know we give them a little something. Uh, but it goes back to our theology and what we're taught. And, and as, as uh, Pastor Terrence is saying, we need black theologians and we also we definitely need them right now in our seminaries because right now, even yes. black, ministers, black ministers are being taught this specific kind of gospel and we're perpetuating the same beastly information. <laughs> so, it, you know, we definitely need to address this really, really right now. It's very urgent. So and I, and I, it's important that we understand, and as you were uh, bringing up there, Ingram, that, that, that Adventist eschatology is rooted in the idea of divine justice. Mm. Uh, of course, that's something they learned from, I don't know if they learned that from the black church or what. Um, <laughs> and as uh, Sydney and, and, and Maury pointed out there, where they made reference to Richard Allen, who was the, um, the AME founder in America, where you know his was his theology was radical as mm-hmm. far as you know the the search for divine justice and looking for it in Christ so i what what i think what Maury and uh, and sydney wanted to point out is the extent to which there's so much we can learn mm-hmm. from from black eschatology if i may mm-hmm. put it that way <laughs> you know black eschatology uh, mm-hmm. It's radical, and and I think that Adventism <laughs> itself was rooted in that quest for divine justice, mm-hmm. uh, and and it had begun even in its in its uh, in its in the early days to address those systems of injustice in American society, which we have somehow <laughs> withdrawn ourselves uh, uh, from that. And um, uh, Ingram, uh, another person, another book I want to re- read is one by. Um, I think it's Michael Campbell. I think he's at Southwestern mm-hmm. Adventist University, where he showed where he actually, you know, chronicled the history of how Adventists lost its way <laughs> by joining hands with the fundamentalist movement. Uh, can I just respond too with that? Um, I I love I love what you're saying, Dr. Hemi, and I think it goes back to what I wanted to say uh, earlier. Is is again the the strength of black thought. And uh, that is really gener- the generational quality of black people in America uh, searching for God, doing theological work. 
um, and that the Adventist, the Black Adventist Church, is not completely ruined, you know, by how we've been informed with theology. One of my one of my heroes, Adventist heroes, is actually T R M. T. R. M. Howard is one of my one of my Adventist heroes. Not, maybe a lot of not people don't know him, uh, but T. R. M. Howard was a black Adventist physician in the South, um, and uh, he was known uh, by a lot of people. Uh, what T. R. M. Uh, Howard did was he was the one who recommended um, um, that Emmett Till have a autopsy uh, back in uh, back in those times, if you know anything about Emmett Till. And he was the physician who recommended, no, get an autopsy and make sure that you, uh, and so he actually helped the family and informed the family, which in that way, uh, launched the civil rights movement in, in a lot of ways as we know it uh, with the public um, open casket of Emmett Till. And so here is one of our black Adventist hero who um, is coming up in the medical system and done outreach and a lot of my other my other black hero, um, uh, um, Dr. Charles Joseph out in, Cal and out in Chicago, who was doing this work in Mississippi. I mean, th this is what our black Adventism has informed us to do these things. And so all is not completely lost, but I love what uh, uh, London is saying is that we need to come and, and um, bring our Adventist theologians uh, to the table. And, you know, my, one of my questions is, Dr. Freeman, is who are the Adventist theologian gatekeepers? I mean, Who's making the decisions about what we believe? Who's making the decisions about what we need to adjust? It comes in GC session, but where are, who are these, our primary theologians? Who are our gatekeepers? And the only places we do know is centered right there in our Adventist seminary. And that does perpetuate. And if you do that demographic of the seminary, we see that in the next couple of years, uh, the church will be completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, and that's, I, that's why I believe that Oakwood is, is so important. Uh, I know that Oakwood in its theology department traditionally has been uh, focused on teaching and preparing the next generation of pastors and, and servant leaders. I, I think there is a, a space and time and, and we're in a time where um, we need we need more scholarship coming out of our school in, in, in that way. Uh, I think, I think, um, I think we were well positioned to, so to support that at this moment. So that's a plug for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that, uh, that we have three of you, uh, that are, uh, that are in school now, uh, pursuing, uh, theological, uh, education at the doctoral level to help to contribute in that regard. Uh, one of the things that I want to do now is really get to our, our audience questions. And uh, the first one that, uh, that I want to address is, um, how do I address black liberation theology uh, to my family who are Trump supporting? Uh, and it seems fruitless when, when trying to, to address some of these issues. Don't do I, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I go think, ahead. <laughs> I, I, I like I like the approach that um, uh, Dr. Nicholas Miller uh, takes uh, at the at the seminary. He does uh, lots of seminars and presentations um, highlighting social justice issues uh, in um, conservative circles, and the approach that he takes is that. He will essentially take the, the writings of Ellen White, the writings of the pioneers, and find those uh, same social justice messages that he wants to promote and, and just present that to people and so that they can understand that this is Adventism. It, it, it's, mm. not, it's, not, it's not a, uh, a conspiracy by the liberal left to take over Adventism. It, this is Adventism. <laughs> and so that, I, I like that, that particular approach in my own uh, my own opinion I think it's important also for us to re-highlight uh, a doctrine that I think a, a many of us have let go of and, and have thrown by the wayside but I think it still has some life left in it and, and some utility and that is the investigative judgment um, I think if, if people were to read the investigative judgment in the light of Matthew chapter 25, 
it, it would uh, open people's eyes uh, to, to a, a different perspective, that it's, it is not about whether you eat cheese or wear jewelry, but rather, are you embodying the, the life of Christ? Are you feeding the hungry? How are you treating the foreigner? Uh, these types of things. That is actually the criteria uh, that the investigative judgment is going to, to run off of. And unfortunately, many of us are, are failing uh, at that and our churches are not preparing us for that, that particular uh, process. So another question is, uh, the recent Black Lives Matter movement and riots have been re removing statues, etc., that pay homage to slavery and oppression. Should Adventists seek to move away from non-diversified -diversi imagery? Hmm. Not, I think we're having a problem with the term non-diversified imagery. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. So white Im so essentially we have white imagery, right? So if you if we have white pictures of Jesus, right? We have in our whether it's a black church or it's a predominantly white church in a state conference, um uh the disciples, Jesus himself, they generally we have pictures of Jesus as um our our biblical characters as white, essentially. Um, and then, you know, just how we think about things, uh, should we be pushing back on that? That's what I'm, what I'm mm -hmm. um, thinking that that question is, is getting at. Mm -hmm. Well, like you, I guess, as I said, you know, um, the gospel came West. <laughs> Everything was taken out of the ancient Near East and brought West. Everything was Westernized. So, I think I don't know the extent to which, but to the extent that it is, it is, uh, it may deny the sense of spiritual agency to particular peoples. To those extents, uh, I think we should re re rethink the way we are we are representing in imagery, um, Jesus, you know, and the other Bible characters. We probably need to to make them represent the real culture out of which they came. And it's more than just the imagery, but since that's the question, you know, we can. Mm -hmm. I think we should be intentional about educating um, on how damaging and destructive uh, these images are. And, you know, instead of just, you know, kind of taking an approach where we just ask to remove them, but it would be helpful to educate mm -hmm. on why these things are destructive, why mm -hmm. it hurts. Uh, I even think about our own, um, my own, our own white brothers and sisters who there's imagery in some of the, um, I can't remember which book it is, but there's an image of, of Jesus kind of sitting on the throne. Uh, it's like in the forties or fifties and, you know, this person standing alone, uh, waiting for the judgment. And there's images like that, that are even destructive on how, as Dr. Lennon mentioned, the investigative judgment, I think that's the image of the investigative judgment that looks um, very difficult. And so just, you know, finding random people and sprinkling a black person here and an Asian person there and a second coming of Jesus picture is it is it really, really talking about um, why these things are in destructive, why whiteness and adapted just unilaterally in an Adventist context is painful. And uh, but I, I would agree that we definitely need to start that um, that process. When I, when I think about about this question, I think about my uh, my time when uh, I was uh, doing some research, r research in Chicago, and I was visiting my sister in, at Andrews. And um, that may have, this may have been three years ago. But when uh, I was there, I stayed over to that Sunday. So I could I could go to two churches. I went to two churches on that day. So I went to Saint Sabina. Um, it's a Catholic church um, with with the um, the pastor is Father uh, Michael Flegger Flegger, I believe, and um, he's done some real. He's a a white gentleman, but done a lot of uh, great work related to social justice within. Uh, the black within the black community, and it was interesting to have a a white priest uh, with black images everywhere, black angels, 
Black Christ, uh, all of the the traditional Catholic uh, symbols were black, and so um, it was it was an amazing thing. And then later on, uh, later on in the day, I went to Trinity United Church where um, uh, Otis Moss the uh, Third is past is pastor. Uh, previously, uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright. But in that in that space, it was essentially you had black people um, or black disciples, uh, a black Jesus, uh, and then even uh, a lot of the church uh, historical church figures were uh, that were highlighted were black. So it was just an affirming both in, at both churches. It seemed like a affirming space. Uh, as a as a black Christian uh, to be in, and so I have not necessarily uh, seen it as um, as prominent in Black Adventist churches, but it was nice when I did visit those other churches to kind of see that type of that type of imagery uh, there. But, but uh, is an- even that is even that healthy though, because. Um, I'm just thinking that, you know, that perhaps we should just represent Christ, who was Jesus of Nazareth. How did he look? Perhaps that's what we should do rather than try to make Jesus black or to try to make Jesus white because he was neither of those things. Um, So I'm wondering, I'm just asking here, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm wondering to what extent is it healthy for us to make jesus of nazareth into our own image so to speak well aren't aren't we made in the image of god yes but um the image of god is not necessarily a physical image (laughs) the image of god is the life that is god in us but the question is jesus of nazareth why don't we simply represent jesus of nazareth as he is historically when we are making jesus white or making jesus black we're moving away from the historical Jesus. And, and that's when we move as long as we move away from the historical Jesus, we begin to distort him based on our doctrines, dogmas, we begin to distort. And, and it's the whole point with the gospel. We have distorted Jesus. We have taken him off the streets of Nazareth. We have cleaned him up, shaved him up, and, and made him what we want him to be, you know? Uh, perhaps we need to go back there and meet the real Jesus, the real one who spoke out against injustice and oppression and who was lynched as a result of his activism. We probably need to get back to that real Jesus. You know? Well, oh, go ahead, Dr. Pillman. Yeah. I, I would say I, I agree, but I, I think I agree. H- however, I think that where we are in our society, we are reacting to the white Jesus that was presented. And so all we have right now is a representation of a white God. And we're just saying, hey, I want uh God to represent me, which he does. If he is the God who uh, who is with the oppressed, then, I mean, the oppressed are people of color. <laughs> so whether he was a, a light black person or a darker, it doesn't matter. He's a, a people, he's a person of color, some type of color. Um, and so I think we're, we're being more, people are being more reactive than we are um, trying to, you know, bring Jesus back yeah. to his historical nature. And in some sense, I don't see a problem with that. I, I don't see a problem with people trying to see Jesus in the light that reflects who they are. And I think the reason why we have the issues we do in the church is because Jesus has been portrayed in a certain way. And so we don't see a representation of us in all facets of our church. In, in, in a, if we are 41% of the, the worldwide church and our leadership is predominantly white, American white. We don't see representation, representation there. We don't see representation in the scripture. When we were given scripture, representation of the scripture was Eurocentric. So all we're doing is fighting back saying, hey, I want to see the God who uh, uh, affiliates himself with the oppressed. And to me, I, I don't see it as, a, as an issue. White, black, you know, white, Asian, um, black, Asian, whatever, whatever color we want to give him. Black, Asian, male, female. Whatever mm-hmm. gender you want to give him to. You know? mm-hmm. If you affiliate with the oppressed, I think that it's okay for people to, to want to see that and to, to know that, you know, that God is with us. In, in, in the in the midst of oppression, it, to me, it's important. I, I see it as uh, important to our faith. But yeah. but just oh. make sure we're not being reactive, though, because reaction is never 
the 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 best uh, response, you know, but proaction rather. But but you know, like I said, I get your point. I'm just throwing it out just to make sure that that we look at all sides of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I don't I'm not so particularly uh, highlighting or, or making primary primary the historical Jesus. Um, that is a part of of Christ, the the universal Christ. The and we and we and this is another discussion, but we have really gotten familiar with gendering God, right? Mm, God is not yeah. gendered, right. and right. we we understand that through Scripture. But but God is not gendered. He is, but Jesus was. Jesus was Christ in the flesh, but nobody's seen that Jesus. Nobody living has ever seen the biblical Jesus. No one knows what Jesus was like before creation. And we will be surprised to see what Jesus looks like when he comes again. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, I think that's what theology is, is to see. I think that's where theology starts is to see God, it, to see God as yourself to see that God created you and that we are created beings. And I think about uh, some of the, the unknown or not well, uh, not well uh, resourced theologians, uh, some of the organic theologians like Tupac, who does great <laughs> theological work, uh, filmmakers like Spike Lee, uh, and, and even womanist uh, theolo theologians who are much more coming from the academy, meaning there is great theological work that wasn't done in the academy. And they had to start when Tupac asked the question, is there a heaven for a G? Mm. He's saying, <laughs> he's saying, is, is, do I see G? Do I see myself? Are there gangsters in heaven? Mm. Right? The gangsters paradise. Ooh. So that's theological word. Mm -hmm. And so Tupac has to see God. He has to see the Christ that way. And we do know that there were gangsters in the disciples. His name was Peter. Ooh. Right. <laughs> Peter was the Tupac. And so, so we, I don't think there's anything wrong with anyone putting the characters of, of, of painting an imagery of, J of Jesus the way they want to. Let's be clear about this. White Jesus is not the same as black Jesus. Right. White Jesus was intentional mm. to create oppression. That was a created thing. Mm -hmm. That wasn't just some person who decides to care to paint Jesus as a white person. A white Jesus was intentional to build inferiority, to say that God is white. And so I 100% reject white Jesus as a social construct. And I understand people say, well, I don't care what color he is. Uh, but but that's a, just to be honest here, that's a very privileged position. Yeah, exactly. I want to see a black I Jesus. I mm -hmm. need to see the black Jesus that's a woman. I need to see that. I need to mm -hmm. see where Jesus shows up to me in my life. And Jesus does not always show up as a Nazarite. He shows up through the voice of a single mother, my single mother. And that's where Jesus shows up. So I'm open enough to, to give people the opportunity to express God. And I think God is big enough to Excellent uh, so conversation. We, nice. Yeah. So we have, we have two more <laughs> questions from, from our audience and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, so to this to this question that we just asked, a one audience member said one of the emerging discussions uh, is that Palestine be, is Palestine being considered as part of Africa. Thus, this is why for some that Jesus must be identified as African. Is this helpful for the decolonization project? Well, Jesus was informed very much in Africa. We do know that he was raised, you know, in Egypt uh, to very formative years. I don't know exactly what age, um, but, you know, for a person to go from zero to five, if I moved to Korea when I was five years old, I would pretty, pretty much be socialized as a Korean. And so we do know that Jesus has that in his background. I don't know how helpful that is um, to the decolonizing project. But uh, going back to what I said before, nobody owns Jesus, nobody owns God. I guess it could be helpful, but I guess that's some work I need to I need to do. We yeah, know for it, sure he wasn't white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that's why that's why what you said there, um, uh, Terrence, is that white Jesus is 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 purposeful. It's calculated uh, because he wasn't white at all. <laughs> 
some his some historians uh argue that what we now call the middle east was a part of africa right it, before it's just been you know it it's been european europeans that sliced it up slice slice things up to say okay these these individuals are not african these are are arabs right and so you have that kind of nuance that goes on there but the last the last question that i want to take is what role does our Seventh Day Adventist seminaries play in perpetuating or liberating Adventist theology? Mm. What's your analysis on where most of our institutions stand right now? Perpetuating the status quo or rich teaching content that offers tools for decolonization? I, I think we got a couple, we have a couple, uh, well, we got a couple of Andrews people here, so I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair to ask him that. That's not fair. I know. You gotta go to I work. Here. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's a that's a tough question. I'll take it. All right, they're gonna take it. Uh, <laughs> I'll I'll take a stab at it. Um I, I can only speak from my own experience in the uh, theology department at, at the seminary. And personally, I've received a lot of support, uh, encouragement to pursue uh, black theology studies. Um, I don't think it's a secret that most of the faculty is, is white uh, and uh, either North American white or, or Eastern Europeans. Um, and for me personally, I think the work of black theology and black Adventist theology needs to be done by black Adventists personally. Mm -hmm. that, that's just how I feel. So I don't expect a majority white you know, institution to produce a, a black theology. That being said, many of those theologians are doing work that can be used and, uh, and utilized for the creation of a black Adventist theology. So for example, I, I'm gonna, uh, I hope I don't get these people in trouble, but I'll just throw their names out there. Um, for example, I've, I mentioned uh, Dr. Nicholas Miller, the work that he's doing in retrieving some of these uh, early uh, Adventist concepts that the, the, the white supremacy here in the United States is also part of, of the, this beast complex. It is not just a religious issue, but it's also a, a human rights issue in regards to slavery and the oppression of, of black and brown people. Um, there's also uh, Dr. John Peckham, for example, with this theodicy of love, which I believe can, is going to be very helpful towards, towards a black theodicy uh, from coming from a great controversy perspective. So there, there are other individuals as well who are very favorable to liberation theology, to, to black theology require the reading of certain authors in, in their in their coursework. I'm not gonna name their names, but it, it is there. Um, and if if you if you look for it, you, you can find it. And no one is telling anyone there that you cannot study uh, black theology or, or liberation theology. That being said, there are some, I believe, professors who they have not yet seen the light that their theology is not unbiased. And so they view their theology as simply theology and what other people are doing is black theology or feminist theology or liberation theology. And they don't realize that what they're doing is simply white supremacist theology. They just, but they don't realize that, right? So I think there's, there's this uh, misunderstanding of the subject object uh, and a relationship and epistemology that's going on with some Adventist theologians. I'm not calling out anyone specifically, but at the end of the day, no one's is going to stop you from, from pursuing um, that, that, that line of work, liberation theology or black theology. And I would just pitch this out there. If there's anyone interested in doing that work, please, you know, uh, apply to the seminary, get, get your MA, do your, your doctorate, because we, we do need more, more black uh, theologians in, in the Adventist church. And we need not just black theologians, we need African-American theologians, which is what Absolutely. we're short at. I don't know how many Absolutely. of us here are actually African-American. I am an implant from the Caribbean. <laughs> How could, could you talk about that that nuance that nuance there because um there may be some 
that may that may take issue with making making a distinction i think we need to there is a distinction because the way we experience america coming from the caribbean is different from the way african americans who were here from the transatlantic slave trade different from the way they experience america and a lot of us from the caribbean and africa do not recognize that and it becomes difficult for us to be in solidarity you know, with with with, uh, with African Americans, they understand things we don't understand. You know, um, uh, when, for example, uh, a, a white person says to 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 a black person, "You're keeping out the job, right?" You know, the African American hears that differently from from the Caribbean person. Are you keeping out the job? An African American person hears that differently because he has a different experience. So we. And, and for me, I think it is very important when we are placing blacks in our seminars or wherever, it, it has now become overcrowded by uh, uh, blacks who are not actually African-Americans. And I'm not saying we should you know, not have those, but we're saying we need more representation. And I think Oak would need to start training some more theologians that are African-Americans. Um, the African Americans have been mainly preachers, you know, <laughs> and I say big time preachers, but we need some more theologians because they bring something to the conversation that is absent from the blacks who are actually implied. Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, black theologians, well, I want to first say that we definitely need black theologians, but specifically black female theologians to contribute. Mm. We definitely need black yeah. academic female theologians. Yeah. But I think um, as a black person in America, I think if you've gone through this educational institution and we aren't really talking about the pedagogy of racism, but if by mm. the time you've gone through as a black person in America, elementary school, high school, and college, you are absolutely exhausted with white institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the desire for graduate work in theology to specifically in our context is, is not necessarily doing, uh, doing a different type of theological work. In other words, our theologians aren't necessarily asked to contribute anything new to the conversation. Adventists aren't as, as comfortable with new light and new revelation <laughs> as they are in just, just understanding it differently, you know, historical research. Uh, but I think there is, you know, to, I think a lot of black Adventist pastors, it's not that they're afraid of the academy or don't want to go into the academy, but it's definitely a different experience uh, that, you know, at least for me personally, that it is exhausting to have to come at that level and really defend your blackness at that point. Mm -hmm. And so and, and what does that in our in our structure, obviously, a, a, an advanced degree doesn't give you any more money. So, um, you know, just give you more debt unless you unless you got some money. <laughs> but, um, you know, other than that, I don't know other than the call to say we need our black uh, leaders to write, our black academics to to create resources and, and to contribute to the narrative. And then we need to be at the table uh, when we are developing um, and changing some of our, our theological uh, conclusions. And if I may say, you know, Terrence, I, I have three kids. Two were born in Jamaica. They came here at age four and eight, respectively. One was born in, in America. And... Uh, and I look at him now at age 19, and I wish I wish I had intended on sending him to Howard University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because right. as someone who was born in America, I don't see that African-American spirit there, that consciousness of, mm -hmm. of, of the average African-American male. And, and, and so that's why I'm saying that, right. you know, there is that different experience and, and, and a very important experience that must come to the conversation because I get much of my black consciousness from African Americans mm. themselves. Mm -hmm. They teach us something about the experience here that we need to wake up to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because we're sort of in this bubble, <laughs> mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. I think Chaplain Pilgrim was going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say so to address the question uh, that is presented. Um, if you go through it, the seminary, you will notice that the curriculum 
does, is not inclusive of black theology, the black experience, uh, minority experience. It's heavily Eurocentric. Um, now we do have professors at the seminary who, <laughs> dare I say, woke and who try to incorporate, um, you know, in, within their classes to incorporate uh, black theology, if I, if I can say that, or liberation theology, I'll say that. But the curriculum itself, it's heavy Eurocentric, and it, as a result of the people at the table who are making these decisions do not reflect us. So we're not at the table, which goes to get, uh, goes again to our, our earlier point that there needs to be a representation of minority communities at the table so that our curriculum can reflect, um, or reflect our experiences. Uh, which is why our theology that we preach also does not reflect our experiences because the people at the table do not reflect us. Um, and we will continue to perpetuate the same type of bad theology that we have in our congregations because the people who are coming out of the seminary, I, I, I was only uh, introduced to black liberation theology, black theology, because I had a friend who went to Emory Seminary and at mm. every seminary, they were teaching James Coon. They were, they were teaching all this information. Mm -hmm. That's how I became aware of it. Even his, his um, um, practical, practicum, you know, our practicums, we go to a church and that's our practicum. Their practicum, they have to go to, to jails and to foster homes. They had literal uh, world experiences. Uh, and so I'm saying this to say that we have to have a seat at the table in order to make change with our curriculum, with our theology. Um, one of the things I, was, I, will, I will say is that our regional conferences, they have seen the gap and what they have decided is that they are uh, putting together in every couple of years to sponsor a, a black, uh, whether male or female, to go to the seminary and get a PhD in, uh, in theology. So that's one of the things that the, the regional right. work is working on to make yeah. sure that we have representation. But we need more people at the table. Um, and in, in our context, the only way we get to the table is we fight our way to the table. So there's a lot of fighting and pushing that needs to happen. I do want to shout out Dr. Hyveth Williams and uh, Dr. Martin Hanna, which was my favorite professors and uh, definitely gave me the courage to do what I'm what I'm interested in now. So I do want to shout them out that they're there. There's brilliant theologians, uh, but I don't know if they would you know do black theology, but they're they're just brilliant theologians uh, from the beginning. So I do got to shout them out. <laughs> that that's awesome and I, I think that shows the importance of of representation right that yeah. that you see a model of of what right. you can what you can be i would right. hope that the that the scholarship that the regional conference uh is putting together is one that uh in particular looks at african americans that's been a part of the conversation of those those uh, uh such as myself has been has been encouraging them to do is is although we can say black we we also want to be intentional about having african americans uh in such uh, to gain such opportunities so i want to say thank you to each of you for for being willing to to share your your wisdom and insights uh with us today uh i again i'll say thank you to dr uh, olive hemmings Chaplain Pilgrim, Pastor Terrence Taylor, and Pastor London Ingram. Uh, again, I would like to, to say thank you to uh, Mr. Kirk Nugent and uh, his company Composition for facilitating the audiovisual uh, needs of, of today's program. And of, of course, again, to my wife for her support. Uh, just another reminder, um, if you've enjoyed this discussion, you really won't want to miss uh, the Decolonizing the Black Mind Summit, which will take place on Thursday night, November 19th, and culminate on Sabbath afternoon, November 21. Uh, speakers will include Dr. Wesley Knight, Pastor Lola, uh, Lola Moore Johnston, Dr. Uh, Tiffany Llewellyn, Pastor Kimberly Bolgen, Pastor Marquise Johns, Dr. Lorena Ray, and Pastor Joshua Mapunga, and Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst. Uh, this will, uh, again, be a power-packed event that you don't want to miss. To keep up to date regarding the details uh, of the summit, please go to my website, uh, www.drsydneyfreemanjr.com. 
and my professional uh, Facebook page, www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. So at this time, I would like to ask that Pastor Taylor uh, please close us, close this program out with prayer. Thank you. Our God in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to think about you, to know you, and to know you from our created beauty. We thank you for creating blackness as an expression of who you are. And as we discuss these matters, Lord, our intention is to make a better church, uh, to really purify the bride that you're coming for, and that it would be without spot and wrinkle. We pray for all of our, um, all of the black uh uh, constituents in our church denomination. We pray for all of our white uh, constituents and all of our constituents worldwide, that Lord, we would take the courage to be the church that is prophetic, uh, truly in nature, um, and not just in practice, that we would look at these things with an open heart, open mind, and that we would really search the scriptures to discover what you are saying today. And Lord, may you be pleased with our work. Bless each person on the panel, each person watching and listening, and we look forward to the next discussion. We love you in, in your name. We pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you so much again uh, for everyone who's who stayed by and, and watched uh, this program and for the participants. Uh, please don't forget to like the Facebook page, www.facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. And subscribe to my YouTube page. We're at 313 subscribers. We need to get it up to 500. When you get up to 500, you're able to do uh, some other creative things. And so we're trying to get those numbers up so we can do that to provide more uh, content to you guys. Uh, also, uh, visit my my. Uh, my website, Dr. Sydney Freeman Jr. .com for resources and announcements regarding uh, uh, additional resources and planning. Continue to have a blessed Sabbath. Blessings. <laughs>